Good morning. How you guys doing? Good. Y'all ready to get in the Word together? Come on. If you brought a Bible, you can go with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 13. 1 Chronicles chapter 13. And while you're turning there, have you ever experienced something that you waited a really long time for? It's a, good, it's, it's a good thing when you finally get to experience something that you've waited and anticipated for a long time, right? Like maybe you finally boarded the plane to go on that vacation that you've been planning for months. It's an exciting moment. Or maybe you dreamed for years about going to a certain college and you finally walk into your first class on campus. Maybe you finally get the job promotion uh, and you walk into the new office or you sit in your new company vehicle or whatever it was. Uh, maybe your boyfriend who was dragging his feet forever finally proposed. Um, I know there's people in the room, you know, who got pregnant after years of trying, and you finally experienced that moment of holding that baby in your arms. When you've waited for something for so long and you've dreamt about it for so long, it can be a really exciting time, right? And oftentimes, those moments and those things that we waited for, it marks a new season in your life, right? It's a new season of parenting. It's never going to be the same. You're never going to sleep the same. It's, it's a season of being the boss and being the one in charge or, or, the, or a new chapter where you're married and everything in your life is now done until death do us part from a different lens. And with that moment, it often comes with new opportunities, Right? There's new opportunities, you have new responsibilities. It's a whole new season. And this is where we find David this morning. This morning we're continuing our series on the life of David. Uh, I believe this is the, is it week 10 already? 10 weeks in David, man. There's so much in his life. Uh, so much more than just that battle with Goliath. Um, we know that David, he had waited a really long time for this moment. He was anointed to be king as a teenager, and around 15-ish years later, he, got, uh, he became king of Judah, which is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And after seven years of civil war, the kingdom gets fully united underneath David. And so by the time we come to 1 Chronicles 13, our passage this morning, the year is 1003 before Christ. And David is finally king. So he's 37 years old. Remember, he was anointed as a teenager. Now he's 37. He takes possession of Jerusalem, and he sets up there as king. And so... What's going to be his first order of business as the king? The man after God's own heart. Think about it. He waited somewhere close to 20 years for this moment. He was a shepherd in his father's house. He killed Goliath. He's spending a season serving Saul. Then he's spending a season running from Saul because Saul gets jealous, wants to kill David. And it was this long, difficult season between the promise and the palace. He started from the bottom. Now he's here. Now what? He had a lot of time to think about it, right? Years of looking ahead to this moment. Someday I'm going to be king. What's going to be his first act as king? Like, think about it. Like a presidential candidate that gets elected, they walk into the Oval Office for the very first time. Whatever David gives himself to first is going to communicate a whole lot about what's important to him. It's going to communicate about what he values and the kind of leader that he's going to be over this nation. Super significant moment. Let's pray and then take a look at what he did. God, we thank you so much for this morning. Uh, we just rejoice in you. We rejoice in the life that we have in you. God, I'm so grateful for baptisms and just getting to celebrate with those who have made that decision. And just the reminder for all of us who have chosen to follow you that at one time we were separate from you. And yet you pursued us and loved us and we heard the gospel message and you Put faith in our hearts, God, and you've changed our, our lives ever since then, God. We just are so grateful. And I thank you for this present moment. We thank you for this morning, and we just welcome your presence. We ask that you would increase in this place. Would you speak to us as we look at your word together in Jesus' name? If you agree, say amen. All right, First Chronicles 13. If you're there, we're going to start in, in the first verse. It says, David conferred with each of his officers the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. Then he said to the whole assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you, and if it's the will of the Lord our God, let us send word far and wide to the rest of our people throughout the territories of Israel, and also to the priests and Levites who are with them in their towns and pasture lands to come and join us. So first thing he does, he gets, his most influ gets with his most influential guys, his leaders, and he says, hey, 
if it seems good with all you guys and if it's God's will, let's, let's send a message to everyone in Israel. Let's send couriers out and we want to invite everybody to come together. And so if you're there as one of the officers, you're thinking like, okay, we're gathering everybody for what? Like, what are we going to do? Verse 3, let us bring the ark of our God back to us, for we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. The holy, whole assembly agreed to this, to do this because it seemed right to all the people. Somebody say, bring the ark. It's the title of the message this morning. Before anything else, bring the ark. The first thing David wants to do is assemble everybody in the nation to go get the ark and bring it back to Jerusalem. Uh, now, what was the ark? This isn't the ark that, like, is from Genesis 6, you know, that Noah's boat that he built. They're not going to get some big boat. Uh, this one we read about in Exodus. I think we may have a picture of it. Um, but this ark, it was a rectangular box. It was about four feet by two feet by two feet. It was made of acacia wood. It was, the whole thing is overlaid in gold. Um, and this is, God had instructed Moses to build this ark when he was in the wilderness, uh, to have the Israelites build this while they were in the wilderness. And inside the ark, there were some things. Anybody know what was in there? There's some manna. There's a gold jar with manna, which was the food that God would cause to miraculously appear on the ground uh, so, while the Israelites were in the wilderness so they didn't starve. Every morning it appeared there. So they got a golden jar of the manna. What else is in there? Ten Commandments. Come on, Dom. There's the two tablets that God had written on, the Ten Commandments, and those are in there. There's a third thing. Aaron's staff. So Aaron, his staff was in there, and God had caused Aaron's staff to miraculously bud. It's not planted or connected to anything, but he caused it to bud as a sign that God had chosen Aaron to be the priest. So these things are in there, and then the lid on top are those two cherubim, these angels, and in between them is, known, uh, is a spot known as the mercy seat. And this is what I want to highlight here is that the mercy seat was right where the actual presence of God and the manifest glory of God would dwell. I want you to think about how significant this is. So this is the earthly throne of God. Like this is where his presence would dwell among his people. And because God's presence was there on the mercy seat, dwelling with the, with the ark, it was the centerpiece of worship and of miracles for the people of Israel. It's a centerpiece of worship, so eventually it would be put into a temple that David's son Solomon would build. But from the time of Moses until David's day, it was in a, starts with a T, anybody know? The tabernacle. It was in a tent. It's a portable tent. And God's people, would, they would come to the tabernacle to worship. They would draw near to God's presence to worship. They would pray towards it. They would face the tabernacle and pray towards it wherever they were. And it was also the centerpiece of miracles. Because, come on, when God is in a place, when his presence is in a place, miracles happen. Amen? Um, when the priest carried it into the Jordan River, suddenly... The Jordan River stops upstream. God stops the river, and then they cross over. All the Israelites cross over into the promised land. Uh, on another occasion, shortly after that, they take the Ark of the Covenant, and they do some laps around the walls of Jericho. And then God brings all the walls crashing down and gives them the city. So, miracles. And for, to, for us today, we don't have the Ark, right? We don't know where the Ark is. Nobody knows where the Ark is. Some people might claim they might know, but... We don't have the ark because we don't need the ark. Because the ark is actually foreshadowing of Jesus. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Um, his spirit is inside of every believer. So if you believe in Jesus, you are the temple of the, the Holy Spirit. You are the new tabernacle that, that houses the very presence of God. And I want you to just, uh, I'm going to nerd out for just a second. Follow me, and then we'll go back. Um, just as the ark contained the law the Ten Commandments, Jesus, we know, is the fulfillment of the law. Do you see the symbolism? Uh, just as Aaron's staff is in there, uh, you know, symbolizing that Aaron was the priest that God chose, how many of you know that Jesus is the great high priest that God has installed forever? The manna is in there. Jesus is the bread of life. And if we come to him, we are satisfied and we experience the fullness of life that God intends for us. This is a picture of Jesus. And David understood there's no greater treasure in the entire world. The very presence of God, the glory of God. And so now that he's king, he says, before anything else, 
let's go get the ark. We're getting the ark, and it's coming close. Look with me at verse 3 again. David says, let us bring the ark of our God back to us, for we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. Okay, if your parents are in the room, don't nod or raise your hand. But have you ever observed your parents and thought, when I'm a parent, I'm going to do things differently? My parents, uh, they always watched, like, super boring stuff when I was a kid. And this was back in, like, in the days when we only had one TV in the house. There's, like, no iPads, no other screens. And so uh, there's no Netflix, no YouTube, none of that stuff. And so you can't just watch stuff whenever you want to watch it. If your show is on, it's on. And if you miss that time, you miss the show. And so I'd be in there, like, watching cartoons. And then my mom or dad would come in, and they'd be like, hey, Levi, let me see the remote. And I'd be like, oh. And I knew what was coming. You know, they flip over to like some stupid news thing or like the, and I remember sitting there. I have like this distinct picture in my mind of like sitting on the floor in front of the couch. And I'm like, when I'm a grown up, like when I'm an adult, I am never watching the news. I'm only going to watch cartoons. I can't wait till I'm the dad. And to be honest, you know, if I can be honest today, uh, most of the time I'd rather watch SpongeBob than the news still. But, um, but the point is, is that we observe things about people who, gone, who have gone before us. And sometimes we're like, that is amazing. Like, I love their example in this area. I'm going to imitate that. I want to follow that. But then there's other times that we observe those who have gone before us, and we're like, I definitely ain't doing that. I, I don't want to be the same in that way. And David, he's made an observation about the way Saul led his king, and he says, here's one thing I'm going to do differently. Let's bring the ark of God back to us, because we didn't inquire of it during the reign of Saul. That phrase when he says we didn't inquire of it, it can also be translated we neglected it. So in essence, David had observed that when Saul was king, we neglected the ark of God. We had God's presence, but we didn't turn to him. He didn't, Saul didn't place much value on God's presence. We, we had it, we had the ark, but everybody else followed Saul's example. They didn't pay much attention to it. They didn't make sure it was close. Nobody was turning to God. Nobody was worshiping him. Nobody was inquiring of him when they needed guidance, any of those kinds of things. Saul had the presence of God with him, but he lived as though he didn't. I wonder how many of us have fallen into the same trap. I know I have at times. You had an important life decision to make, and what college should I go to? Is this, should I date this person? Should I marry this person? Should we move here? Should we buy this car? You know the Bible's clear that God has plans for your life? Psalm 119 says that, it, that the word of God is a lamp to your feet and a light for your path. That means God's word will guide you. God will speak to you and it'll give you direction. God's, uh, so, you know, in James 1, it says that if you lack wisdom, I don't know what to do, ask God. He'll give generously to anyone who asks. But instead... We don't ask God. We don't read the Bible and allow God to speak to us. we got this important decision to make, and instead we lean on our own understanding. We're asking advice of everybody else. And then afterwards, like Saul, we're looking around and we're wondering why things aren't going very well. Because of what Jesus has done for us, we have to understand that you have full, unlimited access to God. Yet sometimes we live as though we don't. Like, we go through hard times, you know, health problems, financial problems, relational stuff, drama. The Bible tells us that God is an ever-present help in time of need. That means he's close, and he wants to help. He wants to do something. But rather than inquiring of him and seeking him for help, we are quick to inquire elsewhere. And David, he's observed this over and over and over and over and over and over again. He says, we didn't inquire of the Lord. We didn't turn to God, and clearly things didn't go out, go very well for us. We're getting whooped by our enemies, and not only are there problems out there, but like inside, internally, there's just junk going on, and within, within our nation and our own family, people, there's all kinds of problems going on, but that's going to change. I believe that God is extending an invitation to some of us this morning to make a change. I believe for some of you, God wants you to see that the destructive behavior of those who came, came before you, it can stop with you. I don't care if your mom struggled with it, your grandma struggled with it, your dog struggled. I don't care who struggled with it before you. You don't have to. You're not a slave to that. You don't have to follow in the footsteps of your dad. 
You don't have to follow in the footsteps of the boss who went before you or the friends that are in school around you and everything that they're doing. And can I tell you, if you have followed in their footsteps for a period of time and you recognize that that is not the path that God has for you, God can help you change. We celebrated it this morning. God turns everything around. My Bible tells me that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. My Bible tells me that if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone. Where is it? It's gone. And the new has come. It's never too late to experience the new, to experience freedom in Christ. Don't believe the lie that you can't be different. David, this man after God's own heart, he decides if there's anything that's going to be different about me than those who went before me, it's going to be that I'm going to be a man that is after God's presence. I'm going to be about God's presence. I've had some incredible examples set for me in my, parent, my own parents, in Pastor Gary, who led faithfully here for so many years. But I've also had some not so good examples. And I don't know about you, but regardless of who has come before you and what examples, what you've observed and who has taught you and who you grew up with and all that stuff, I want to be the kind of person that says, I want to have a more vibrant and alive and exciting relationship with Jesus than those who came before me. God, I, I want to, God, I value your presence. I want to host your presence well. As a matter of fact, uh, can we take a minute just to do that right now? Um, this isn't the end of the sermon yet, but can we just pause for a second and just kind of lean into that heart of David that before taking another step, I just want to invite God's presence. So would you just close your eyes for a moment? And if you feel comfortable, you can put your hands out in front of you as though you're receiving, just open to God in an open posture. And would you just take a moment to welcome him? God, I just invite your presence. God, I'm open, my heart is open, my life is open to you, would you come? In this moment, we just invite you, God, I invite you to come and fill my heart, fill my life, fill every space. Just invite him for a moment, in your own words. Holy Spirit, come. And then would you just take a few deep breaths and just acknowledge his presence with you? You can come back with me. What season of life are you in right now? When you think about where you're at, what's, what's the number one thing that you're pursuing? Maybe for some of you it's a relationship or your education, your career. Maybe it's money. Maybe for you it's enjoying retirement and the grandkids. I just want you to consider what, what would it be like if your number one priority in this season was to host God's presence? What would that look like? Part of the reason why I wanted to pause like we just did is because I want to show you how easy it is that this is something that you can do as you're going about your day, as you're going about your life this week. When you get in your car tomorrow morning, what would it look like if you just, before you flew out of the driveway or wherever you park, that you just sit there for 30 seconds and do what we just did together? God, I welcome you. I don't want to go another step. I don't want to do today on my own. Or when you get out of bed in the morning, if you just kneel beside your bed and you just take 30 seconds with the Lord to welcome him and acknowledge that he is with you. I know for some of us, when you're, when you're done at work or whatever you have going on during the day and you come home, before you walk in the door of your home and see the people that you're going to see in there, I've noticed one of the things that makes the biggest difference for me in that moment and the rest of my evening is if I will take a few moments or seconds in the car and do what we just did. God, I just welcome you. When I come into my, when I go into my house, I want to be ready to, to show your love. I want to, I just don't, I don't want to do that part without you. You with me? Before anything else, bring the ark. Why do you think David cared so much? Why do you think that he placed such a value on God's presence? You know, when I think about his life, David had a history with God at this point, right? So as a shepherd, you remember God showed up for him. 
the lion and the bear come to attack the sheep, and God shows up, and he not only, you know, David lives, <laughs> but he attacks these, these animals, these predators, and God empowers him to grab them by the beard, strike them, and kill them. That's what the Bible says. This guy was a crazy, he was a beast. But because God had empowered him, God showed up in that moment. Or you think about when uh, he saw Goliath, of course. God showed up. He came in the name of the Lord and one sling, you know, one stone. God showed up. God protected him again and again when Saul was hunting him down and pursuing him. God showed up. And he's showing David his faithfulness. Uh, during this period of time when he was on the run from Saul and Saul is still king and he's just, he was inquiring of the Lord and he was asking God, you know, there's an opportunity for battle here. Should I go fight? And when God would speak and say, go fight, I'll deliver them into your hands, guess what happened? He fought and God delivered him, delivered his enemies into his hand every single time and gave him the victory. And then most recently, God had brought to fulfillment this prophetic word that he spoke through Samuel that David, when David was a teenager, that he's going to be king. My point is, is that David recognized that the only reason why he made it this far in his life was God. And he recognized, man, if I'm going to be successful at all in this coming season, when there's a whole lot more on the line because now I'm the king with all this responsibility and all this influence and all these people are following me and they're looking to me, if I'm going to be successful at all, it's only going to be for one reason, God. And so he says, let's bring the ark. I can't do anything until I have the ark. It's kind of like Moses, you know, long before David. We know that, uh, of course, we just talked about how God spoke to him about building the ark. But he was the leader that God placed over Israel. And at that point, Moses had witnessed a bunch of things. He had a history with God, too. He saw the burning bush. What else did Moses experience? He saw God use him to bring some crazy plagues on the Egyptians, 10 wild plagues. He saw God part the Red Sea, deliver an entire nation, the millions of Israelites from slavery. And then after all of it, he's with the people in the wilderness, and now they are completely free from slavery in Egypt, and he is now their leader. Similar spot is David. He is now the one that is over them, leading them to whatever God has. And listen to what he says in Exodus 33. Then Moses said to God, if your presence doesn't go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you're pleased with me and your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? The Lord's presence is what sets us apart. Amen? That's it. I'm an average man. There's always somebody that's more gifted, more talented, better equipped. But it's God's presence on your life that sets you apart. And Moses says, if your presence doesn't go with us, I'm not going. Please don't send us up from here. He had been through a lot in his life. And one thing he had firmly decided was, like, God, I need your presence in my life. If there's one thing I've learned, I need you. Both Moses and David, they refused to lead the people of Israel without God's presence. And I just wonder for us this morning, what would it look like if we had the same attitude? God, I can't make it through this school year without you. God, I can't lead, I can't be the husband or the wife that God's called me to be. I can't, I know I can't parent these kids without, without your help. I can't do anything. I can't succeed at this job. I don't want to be in this job no matter how much it's paying me. If you're not in it, if your presence isn't with me in it, I don't want to be there. God, I just want your presence. Psalm 132 talks about this exact moment that David stepped in as king. And it says this. I, I just want you to catch the, the passion and the urgency that's in David's heart in this moment. It says in Psalm 132, um, 132 verse 1, Lord, remember David and all his self-denial. So David's not writing. Somebody's writing about him. He swore an oath to the Lord. He made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not enter my house or go to my bed. I'll allow no sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Do you see the passion and the urgency? Before anything else, I'm not even going to sleep one night. Some of you know the, the house that my family and I live in now. Um, it was a miracle that we got this house, uh, that we live there. And I'm not going to go into all of it, but I just want to give you a little bit of a glimpse. They got... 16 offers in one weekend. The highest offer was $40,000 higher than ours. And the sellers, they went straight with our offer, and they didn't even counter the price. 
Still haven't met the sellers. I'm fascinated to know someday why that happened. I could tell you probably six or seven other things that were just as crazy and wild about that story um, that are just as incredible. But the day came when we got the keys, and so exciting. Like, talk about waiting and just anticipating, and some of you know what I'm talking about. You get the keys, and you walk in, and man, this is ours. Like, this is crazy. This is so exciting. And I'm telling you what we did, before we, did it, before we moved in a single box, before we did anything else, I grabbed my guitar, and we gathered around our kitchen island, and we just worshiped for a moment. We sang Reckless Love, and I could hardly get out the words. And then we prayed together as a family, and we just kind of went around as a family, and we just thank God. God, thank you so much for this house. God, we don't deserve to be here, but we just thank you for being so good and blessing us with this house. And God, we just welcome your presence. We just invited him. We said, God, would you just come and fill this space? God, we know that our names are on the title to this house, but we just declare in this moment that this house belongs to you. And we just want your presence here, God. We don't know what it was like for the people who lived here before us. And we don't know if they honored you or any of those kinds of things. It doesn't matter. But now from here on out, God, we're saying that this house belongs to you. We want your presence here. We don't want to sleep a night in this house without you. So would you just come and fill every space? What does it look like for you before everything else? What are you facing right now in your life? Where are you at? Before anything else, bring the ark to seek his presence. You know, this is why we begin every year with 28 days of prayer and fasting. God, it's a new year. It's a new season. I don't want to just run into it on my own and just start doing my own thing and my own resolutions. I'm going to seek God first, and we're clearing the table. God, we just want your presence. I know that when you're moving, when you're in it, when I'm with you, in step with you, everything is different, everything. And what do we experience? Tons of breakthrough. All the stuff that with the ark, it's the centerpiece. We are worshiping and we are adoring our Savior, and it's the centerpiece of miracles. All this stuff is breaking out, and God is, is, Jesus is revealing himself as the bread of life. People are satisfied in him, and it's like, man, I was fasting all this stuff that I thought I couldn't let go of, and now I've discovered something so much better. I don't even need that stuff. We start the year that way. It's, this, it's before every service on a Sunday. It's why there's a, a group of us that gather. You're invited by the well, by the way, by the well. Well, okay, anyway. By the way, you are, you are invited. 9.15 every Sunday morning, we gather in here and we just pray and we welcome God's presence and we pray for our time together. Why? Because we don't want to go a step without his presence. We don't just want to play church and come in here and be like, all right, we sang some songs, we listened to some guy, talked to us about whatever. We want to experience God. I know you're here. Every one of us has a desire. Even if somebody drug you here, there is something deep down inside of you that says, if God's real, I really want to know. If God's real, I would love to experience him. I want to experience more. That's what we're about. I want to show you, can I show you one last thing? I want you to see one last thing about David's heart this morning. Um, can anybody tell, her, tell me our mission as a church? Love God, love people, make disciples. What's the first part? Uh, you ever been in love? I want you to think about it. Like, if you've been in love, I want you to think about that moment when you're falling in love with somebody. Like, you're so stoked on that person, and you're just like, man, you can't stop smiling all the time, and everybody else is annoyed. They're like, can you please shut up? Talk. I don't want to hear, talk about them anymore, you know? But it's because they're only spending like five minutes with you because you're spending the whole rest of your life with this other person. And even as excited as you are about where the relationship is, you just want to get closer. Like, you just want to know them more. You want to spend all that time together. Now, if that person suddenly stops texting you, and they stop calling, and you're like, hey, you want to come hang out? And they're just not responding, and they're not showing interest in spending time with you. What does that tell you? There's a problem. They're not as into me as I thought, you know, as, as into them as I am. You know, there's an issue here. Because if you love somebody, you're going to pursue relationships. You're going to want that time together. David, he didn't just seek God's hand, but he sought his face. He didn't see God as, 
okay, he's like this kind of like, I want to get the, the art because it's kind of like my magic trinket or whatever that I'm going to carry around and that's going to ensure my success in everything that I do and so I just got to make sure it's close and then I'm going to do my thing and hopefully it'll bless my life here. No, David's, God, I love you. What does he say in the Psalms? There's only one thing I want in, the li- in my life and that's to dwell in your house all the days. Man, in the same way that the deer is panting for streams of water in the wilderness, God, my soul is panting for you. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? It's not, God, when can you come and bless me? It's when can I just go and be in your presence? He loved God and loved being in his presence. And my prayer is that we would have that same heart. That we don't walk out of here and like, I guess I'll just try a couple times this week to just maybe invite God's presence, you know, a couple times here and there. But that we would have a heart that says, God, I love you. I just want more of you. And so I wasn't even trying to plan this thing, but spontaneously I'm finding myself just going after you at all these different points in time. Would you stand with me? I want to invite the worship team to come back up. And I just want you to consider, what does it look like for you to love God and to pursue his presence in your own life this week? If you really love God and if you are really pursuing his presence this week, what would you do differently For some of you, at the beginning of your week, you know, maybe God's challenging you. You're maybe kind of inconsistent in our times together, and God's asking you to start your week pursuing his presence and being here, seeking him. Uh, or maybe for you this week, at the beginning of your day, spend time with him. We're talk- we talk a lot here about PB&J. It stands for prayer, Bible reading, and journaling. That every morning, before anything else, I'm going to get alone. I'm going to talk with my father. And then it's not going to be a one-sided thing. I'm going to allow him to speak to me. So I'm going to open the word and allow him to speak to my life and direct me today. And then I'm going to write down those significant things that God is speaking to me about. Maybe for you, it's implementing that habit this week. We've got tools. We've got great stuff online. If you just go to our website, desertstreams.com, there's a Bible reading plan and all kinds of tools for you to help you at that time. Um, And maybe for you, you know, as a family for us, uh, on Saturdays tends to be kind of like a family day for us whenever we can and we'll hop in the car together and as we're driving out whether we're going to like adventure at the beach or whether we're just going to like Ikea or going to run some errands whatever we're doing that as we're driving out we'll say hey who wants to pray for our day and we just take a moment in the car to do kind of what we did when we paused like God we just welcome you and we ask that you'd come and bless our day I know this is our family day but we don't want to do our family day without you and so God please But what does it look like for you to love God and pursue his presence? I'll just leave you with this, that Saul, Saul didn't inquire of God. He didn't turn to God often. He didn't value God's presence. And how did it go for him? His life was a mess. His influence and position was taken from him. All the stuff that he was striving to acquire was being pulled straight out of his hands. And we all know people like Saul, and I believe that we've all been in in Saul's shoes at least one point in our lives, experiencing how hard it is when we don't value God's presence with us. And so in response, let's be like David, amen? Let's be a people who say, before anything else, I'm going to be after God's God's heart, God, after God's presence. I'm going to pursue him. God, we just thank you for... We just thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for being present with us. God, we're so grateful for Jesus, that you made a way so that we don't have to carry around some some box with us, (laughs) but that you're with us all the time. And so I pray, Lord, that you would help us to acknowledge you this week. I pray for every person here that as we go, that you would just remind us as we're going to turn to you and I pray that we would find our hearts filled with so much love for you that we just couldn't help but spend more time that we just couldn't help but want more to be in your presence and to pursue you and if that's your desire this morning you say God I just want you to increase my hunger and my desire for you would you just ask him in your own words we're gonna take a few minutes to worship and just to welcome his presence but in your own words just take a couple minutes to do business with God whatever's on your heart